I was joking last week at the Saviour, then I was sort of covering the desk with this alcohol gel. Um, so it suddenly I start sort of swooning and going a bit uh, speech slurring. You know why? Okay, thank you for that. It's, I think it's a real privilege, Phil, to be, be here. I, Chris is away on holiday, by the way, if you haven't gathered. To be here on the day we're getting back into church. It's, it's been a strange journey for us because in the early days, there was four of us in church. And it's really strange having to lead a service and preach. I mean, I know why we're doing it. It was the right thing, but it's lovely to be back, uh, actually, with, with people and getting the sense of what's going on. The other thing is that what you didn't get before was when you made awful comments, you didn't get the groan back at you. <laughs> oh, that's the one. Yeah. Start as you mean to go on, that's folks. The, the other thing is, I, I don't know how Philip feels about this, but I was looking at those puppets, and when you get, get to Ari, don't you just wish you had that much hair? <laughs> 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 but, but anyway, here we are. Um, perhaps a slightly serious note to start off with. Um, how difficult it is to break bad news to people. I'll give you three little scenarios I'm sure you can all relate to. You have a family pet. It's been with you for a long period of time. It's been on holiday with you. And like all pets have gone through the ups and downs of family life and they've always been there to sort of, when things are really low, you can stroke them and all those sorts of things. And one day, pet looks a lot off color. So down you trot to the vet and the vet does all the tests. And said, um, I think the kindest thing would be to, and you know where I'm going to next with that comment, don't you? Or alternatively, have a car that's perhaps past its best and it's developed this rattle. And you take it down to the mechanic who gives it the once over and says, Well, oh, it'd be at least 500 quid. You don't like that. Or well, the other one is mum in about three weeks time, two weeks time, it's the Father's Day, advance warning. And uh, dad gets up and mum kind of comes into the kitchen and says, uh, we've forgotten. <laughs> we were, we were thinking of going to the, ga the old night garage to get you some flowers. But we thought that would kind of be appropriate. But it is really, really hard to break bad news to people. And I mean, if you're a professional like a doctor, then you probably get used to it. But I'm not sure, ones I've talked to, it's not always that easy sometimes. Uh, but this is Isaiah's situation, that he's talking to people who quite frankly just were all over the place and did entirely what they wanted to do. They ignored God, they tried to suit the local kings, the rulers, whoever. They just did their own thing. And Isaiah had the very difficult job of saying, look here. That's not very religious language, is it? But look here. And in a sense, that's what people at the front have to do sometimes. Now, the easiest thing for me and Philip and Chris and Duncan and Jeff is that we are just pointing back to God's word. Isaiah was just saying it as it was, as God was speaking to him. And he was by himself. It was, it was a very lonely job being a prophet. Now, oh, they've given me, they've, they've let me loose with the clicker. Which one do I do? The, the that way arrow, John? I think so. Well, we'll find out, won't we? If suddenly somebody disappears off the back row, I'll press the wrong button. <laughs> Oh, the fonts have gone all peculiar, haven't they? Sorry about that. Uh, I'll explain what you mean. So in, the, if in that passage, you actually split into two themes. First of all, it's the future. And then from verse six onwards, it's the present. And I'm going to start talking about the present. Now, these are not my drawings. Uh, we have somebody absolutely fantastic at church called Ben Makinson. He's a graphic artist. And he does these fantastic 
sketches. So the words, any mistakes on the words, I take responsibility for, but the sketches are Ben's. And I thought it'd be a really good, good sort of way of saying what I want to talk about today. So here we are, we have somebody, what's that person doing? They're kicking the black, it's a black cat, isn't it? And in theory, you're supposed to be very concerned about black cats. We've got other superstitions. You shouldn't walk under a ladder. Well, there's good reasons for that because the two window cleaner lads might be up those ladders and then they could end up on the ground. And that will never do. Uh, my window cleaner's got one of these things with long hose pipes all the way down the dry, all the way up the clothes. And I said, why have you got one? I said, well, apparently you're not insured when you're up a ladder and that. But this isn't the reason other people don't do it. The theory is, this is a so-called superstition, when they're putting Jesus on the cross, there was a ladder, so you don't walk under the ladder. Uh, we don't have a number 13 house on our clothes. There's not like an empty site or anything. It's just the fact that people think 13 is superstitious. And in some, some of these superstitions, you really, you just take them perhaps with a pinch of salt, don't you? You kind of think, well, yeah. But there is a deeper meaning to superstitions. Because if you think about it, what you're saying is that God isn't in control. The superstition that you're worried about is in control. Does it matter whether you live in number, um, how, that house number? It doesn't, does it not? Because, um, but try selling them. That's the tricky. Oh, no, we'll go, we'll go to 15 instead. So, you know, there are those things. But the thing about superstitions is that it's really what, what's saying about your attitude towards God. Now, having scored the first time. Hey! <laughs> Let's hope for him. After 36 years as a lecturer, he's found how to use the PowerPoint clicker. Uh, the misuse of money and wealth. Is it wrong to have money? Is it wrong to have wealth? Well, it isn't because used properly, it is very beneficial. The church over the years has had lots of wealthy benefactors who've left lots of money in trust, the land, the big builders, there's a trust that they have, cars, the biscuit people, there's money there. All throughout the <coughs> Christian church, there's been people who have money and they've left it for good causes. So there's nothing wrong with wealth. <coughs> what is wrong is the fact that we think we own our money. Now, I'm sure that my building society owns my overdraft or mortgage. No, it doesn't. <coughs> but we, we don't own our money. But we work for each other. What do you mean we don't own our money? Well, actually, it's God's money. And he has first call on it. It's ours to do with under his guidance. And that's really very important because the people around Isaiah were people who were misusing their money, they were misusing their wealth. <coughs> they were using it to, uh, to get uh, the wrong things out of life and also to influence people. It were very important, you see, because we have wealth. <coughs> so in other words, you know, that's it. it's not that God has given us this wealth, it's that we have wealth. <coughs> Idols. Have you got an idol? I'm sure you have. Could be a pop group. Could be a car, a particular car. <clears throat> I was, I was, I was thinking about Jeff, Jeff Hutch. He apparently is he reads the Top Gear magazine. And I was kind of wondering if there's like a tanks section in the Top Gear magazine, <clears throat> just for Jeff. But you know. People put a lot of store in the cars that they have and how important they are, and they polish it and they clean it, and they do all the other things that goes on behind that. You see, what is happening with idols is you're saying that the idol is more important than God. You're worshipping your idol, you're not worshipping God. 
And in some cases, you believe that your idol has got power to do things. You want to worship it so that you can, they will give you, the, the idol will provide for you the things that you want in life. Well, of course, <clears throat> that just isn't true. The idol is just a block of stone. It's just a car. It's just sometimes a liability. But what we need to think about in all this are what's our attitude towards idols? Do they run our lives? Do we walk a million miles to go, and, not a million miles, but loads of distance to go and watch a particular pop group, spend all sorts of money buying things? Because that's what we believe will get us stay and it will, will be, it'll be good for us. Now then, pride. <clears throat> <clears throat> Pride's kind of one of those things that, you know, I'm very important and I'm proud of this and I'm proud of that and I'm proud of the other. <laughs> it is hay fever, by the way. I've had it for about a year, so you're quite set. <clears throat> um, pride. <clears throat> Sometimes we say we're proud to be British. I'm, I say I'm English and I'm proud to be English. And in a sense, there's nothing wrong with that to say that I'm proud to be English. So long as I don't kind of dismiss everybody else as inferior who isn't English, because that's the basis of racism. It's saying, I'm superior because I'm British. And I think you've heard these arguments from certain <clears throat> extreme political parties. What you're actually saying is that I'm proud to be British because I'm patriotic about it. And I know that people will have gone to war to keep Britain and England safe. So that's why I want to be proud. I don't know whether you're watching the news this morning, but <clears throat> the, it was the, 70th anniversary of the D-Day landings and they decided they were going to have a proper big memorial to them uh, which they're opening today apparently D-Day landings was the 6th of June according to the news 14 whenever it was and so they've created it a bit like the National War on Arboretum in Staffordshire but actually in France and I looked at that and you look at all these names that go on and on and on of the people who died and you think, well, they did that to give me my freedom, and I should be proud of that. But that doesn't mean I have to look down on other people because they're not English. <clears throat> Sometimes we create uh, views about other races. Um, many years ago, we went on holiday to a place called Remagen, which is in Germany, as a film called The Bridge remark and, and the the chap who ran the hotel was obviously German and we were a, a culture of shearings people just get shearings in for Margaret but uh, <laughs> and there were the culture of shearings people and he the, the owner of the hotel was was still quite a bit distant with the British but he said he took us to a prisoner of war camp on the outskirts of the village <clears throat> and there were Americans and Germans. And he told about the terrible time the officers gave the prisoners. We made the fatal assumption that the Americans were the prisoners and the Germans were the guards. Wrong way round. The Germans were the prisoners and the Americans were the guards. So it's just so easy to lapse into that. <clears throat> but what we do need to do is to think about why we're proud of something and how that honours God. Because that's really important. That's what the theme of the sermon is all about. How does that pride honour God? The future. So we're, we're looking back to the first five verses now. <clears throat> the Mount of the Lord's Temple will be established. Now, at the time, the, the Jewish people, the Israel people of Israel, were very, the temple was very, very important to them. It was the centre of their worship. And there's always only ever been one temple, as far as the Jewish people are concerned, at Jerusalem. It was rebuilt and refurbished, but there was only ever one. In the localities, you had the synagogues. 
But the future that Isaiah was present, predicting was, yes, there would be a Lord's temple. It would be established. But come 33 AD, which was about 750 years-ish after Isaiah was speaking, there would be a different temple established. There will be a temple, not a physical temple, but a temple that was Jesus, whose life, whose death on the cross, and whose resurrection was everything that was about what we, our faith, is all about. The future will also be a time when God will teach us his ways. The whole point of this service and all the other services in the house groups and your Bible studies is about learning what God's ways are. If you think about what you watch on television, there's lots of people who will tell you the right way to do things. Um, the bowl went in our cooker door, in the door, not in the oven, but in the cooker. It's, it's Neff, it's German. So you would think it should be easy, wouldn't you? So we, got, we went on YouTube and there it was, the how to change this bulb in a cooker door. It was a 15 minute video. It took that long. <laughs> and in the end, we called the gas board out because one of these contracts to do it. Um, they like little mushrooms, the bulbs. They're like the sort of things they had in the old overhead project things. And it took a long time. So we looked to the YouTube, we looked to a lot of other things, to teach us how to do things. We're in a school and teach us how, and they're living by how to teach us what to do. But those things on YouTube don't teach us God ways, they just teach you how to put your bulb in. The school, because it has this fantastic religious reputation, does teach us God's ways. And that's important. We need to know what God's ways are. That is the future. Not garlic bread, but learning God's ways. It's going to judge the nations. The nations were at war all around that area. And if you look at modern day Israel, you can see it's still being lived out in that area. The way countries treat other countries. <clears throat> but what Isaiah was saying, God is going to judge the nations. Which means that if he can judge the nation, he is more important than the nations. Of course he is, because he's God, he created the world, he created the nations, and he is in charge. But we don't often want to admit that. Now, this is a very famous verse, beating their swords into plowshares. I think Ben's done a really good job with that, actually. I really like that little picture. Uh, <clears throat> swords into slouchers. In other words, no longer will we be making war. We will be bringing peace, but also we'll be bringing food and prosperity, real prosperity for everybody. That was God's plan. That's what he definitely wanted for his people. That's what Isaiah was saying. <clears throat> And the other thing, one of the final things was that we will walk in the light of the Lord. If you're a fan of Psalm 23, you will know it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. <coughs> Darkness is the absence of God. What we need and what was happening here. <coughs> was that we would walk in the light of the Lord. We would follow him, we would hear what he had to say, and we would do his will. Right, I, I, I must admit, I, I put these bullet points on one slide. I should... <clears throat> Preaching is not for those with nervous disposition. What should our response be? I've talked about what Isaiah was saying to his people seven, well, seven, two, 2,700 years ago. What is our response? Because that's the only thing that matters. History is nice. It's nice to read, but it's not doing anything about the future. What are we doing? What is our response? Well, the first thing is 
to acknowledge there is only one God. We don't have idols. We don't have people around who we worship instead of God. So we think about maintaining God's fairness. What does he want for the world? What does he want for the poor? What does he want for the dispossessed? What does he want for uh, those people who are on the margins of society? And it's our job to help through money or through getting involved in volunteering activists to make sure that fairness is maintained. To work amongst the pe for peace amongst the nations. <clears throat> I suppose if you read, watch the news every night, which I tend to do, you can get quite depressed about this isn't happening, that there doesn't seem to be peace among them. There's always some warring going on somewhere, but it's our job <clears throat> to keep working out the best we can do as part of God's work. And finally, <clears throat> to walk in the light of the Lord. Not in our light, not in other people's light, or not even in the darkness of the evil things in life, <clears throat> to walk in God's light. Now that <clears throat> is something I want you to think about through the coming week. You may only need to pick one of those. It's up to you. But think about, first of all, if you can't do the first one, acknowledge who's one God, stop there. Because if you can't do that, <clears throat> the rest aren't relevant. You've got to start with believing there is only the one God that we worship. And then after that, we can think about how we can develop his will. So let's just bow our heads, shall we? <clears throat> well, we're back in church. We can see our friends. We can't sing, but at least we can see each other. And that's good. And we thank you for that. <clears throat> but we've heard what Isaiah has to say. The words that <clears throat> were saying nearly 3,000 years ago to get people thinking about how they react towards God. But well, help each one of us to think about those things, to do something in our lives which takes us forward down the Christian walk. And this we ask in your name. Amen.